Hello. So, let's kick this off. Let me give, give a bit of a description of who I am and where I come from. So, one, I like Douglas Adams, in case anyone here knows Douglas Adams, big fan. This is not completely random. I used to be a marine biologist. So, uh, originally I came out as a marine biologist and um, then I couldn't find a job, so I ended up writing software. However, I still have a love for biology and I uh, still have a love for marine biology particularly so um, part of my passion is looking how I can combine those two things. So I'll give you an example. Do you know that a social network operates exactly like a pod of dolphins? So you can actually take the same models that you look at modeling a social network, and it's exactly the same way that a pod of dolphins interacts with each other. So there's fun things where biology and technology combine. So I thought I was going to do a talk about how these things work. And something that's always fascinated me is evolution. So man, mankind, has not evolved really a great deal for many hundreds of years. And, you know, some people will say, some of you got less hairy. I didn't, clearly. But apart from that, man really hasn't changed. And I actually think now we are going through what could potentially be the next stage of human evolution. And I'm going to talk through some faces where these things combine. So I'm going to use a word called splice. And splice you use uh, in, in genetics when you combine two bits of DNA. So you splice two bits of DNA together to get something new. So I'm going to talk about splicing biology and technology. So let's start. Let's talk about identity. So identity is an interesting thing. Identity is how you proclaim yourself to the world, so who you are outside, outside the world. And interestingly enough, you have many different identities. And specifically on the internet, you have at least three identities. There is the identity of you really are, who the human being you really are. There's the identity of you want to be. So all, whenever you go online, I can guarantee all of you are better good looking, you've had more girlfriends, and you have more fun than real life. And then you have a third identity, which is actually your digital identity, which isn't actually similar to others. So identity is something that's quite important to how you portray yourself. Now, there's some interesting ways to identify yourself. So here is our cell phone. So I'm going to tell a story. And the story, like most of my stories, involve a girl in a bar. Right? So this story started, I met a girl in a bar. And she said, I want to know you. So what she did is she took my wallet out, and she took all of my cards out of my wallet. And then she looked at all of my cards, and she said, let me tell you about yourself. So she looked, she said, this is where you go shopping. These are the things you like doing on your weekend, all based on the cards. So I thought, actually, let's try this game. Let's look at our mobile. So I take my cell phone. So do this next time you're, you're, you're in a bar um, or anywhere else. Actually look at your cell phone and look at the apps you've got installed on your cell phone. And then classify them into different groups. And then from that, have a look at if you can work out who the other person is, what they like to do. Because it actually tells you a lot. So this is the apps on my phone I have at the moment. And if you run through this, this suggests that I travel a lot. And I do. I, travel, I traveled half a million air miles last year. Um, so, so that I work in technology, because I have a lot of apps that have to do with technology. You can tell from that I've got at least one child, because I've got children app, and probably something to do with payments. But you can actually do a lot based on those apps that are actually installed on the phone. Now, where this gets interesting is what happens? What could you do if one app could talk to another app? So at the moment, most apps on your cell phone are completely independent of each other. But that's really inefficient. Wouldn't it be really nice if those apps could actually communicate to each other and make your life easy? So for example, how many taxi apps have you got on your phone? So if you travel, you've probably got Uber, and then you come to Spain. It doesn't work. So you then have to install a different taxi app. You go to Russia, they don't know Uber, have a different taxi app. Wouldn't it be really nice if your phone could geolocate you and give you the appropriate taxi app for the city you're in at the time? Or wouldn't it be really nice if you're reading a book on your Kindle or on your e-reader, and then you get in the car, and your cell phone knows you get in the car, so it's now going to put Audible through my car stereo so I can listen where I left off. Wouldn't it be nice if those apps all told each other what was going on? So this is something we, we're doing at Braintree at the moment. So we've just released um, something called uh, V.0 and something called OneTouch. 
So what we've done with OneTouch is we've enabled you to put payments into your app, and that app is then aware of what's on your cell phone. So that app is aware that you might have PayPal installed or Venmo installed, which is another company that we own. If we've got either of those installed on your phone, then when you click pay, you don't have to do anything because this app knows you've got it installed, so you have an invisible payment that happens. So I think that's interesting. I think you'll see much more of this. So I'd say the first place that technology and biology will combine to make this new generation is when your devices become part of your identity. Your device is part of your identity. And the sad thing is it's probably going to be more honest than you are. So while I was doing this research, I actually looked this up, and I thought it was quite appropriate for Mobile World Congress. So on average, men tell six lies a day. And you'll be surprised to know, on average, women only tell three lies a day. But the funny thing about the six lies that men tell is four, five, and six are all to do with your cell phone. So there you go. Maybe if we do this, we make men's lives miserable. Um, so let's carry on with this splice here. Identity is different from authent authentication. So you have your identity, but you also need to say, this is me. You can say, this is what is me, but you need to find some way of telling the world about it. So logging into systems. If you think, where is the one place in your life where you keep your identity completely up to date? And I guarantee it's your bank, because that's where your money goes, and you really, really care about your money. So your bank is probably the most up-to-date part of your identity, because you need to know where it's going, you need to know how to get it up, otherwise you starve. So what we've done at PayPal is we, use, we have the bit, something called login with PayPal. So you log into PayPal, PayPal knows who your bank is, and then we use that to identify yourself. So you can use this as an identity service. And there's a lot of things out there that claim they do identity, but you can actually be a dog on a social network. But as I believed until recently, a dog couldn't have a bank account. But there's one state in America where a dog can have a bank account, so that's nearly right now. But identity, once you've got that identity and authenticity, you have to show the world. You have to show the world you're Superman. So you have to declare yourself somewhere. And a traditional way of doing that is passwords. Now, passwords need to die. They really, really need to die. So I'll tell you why. 4.7% of people, password is password. 8.5% of people, password is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 9.7% of people's password is either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, this is bad, right? 14% of pe people's password is listed in the top 10 passwords of the world. 40% of people is listed in the top 500% passwords in the world. 91% of people, their password is listed in the top 1,000 passwords in the world. Now, I'm a hacker and a developer. That's not a hard problem to solve. Right, so already we know these passwords aren't working. But on top of that, you've got at least 60 as an individual. You have 60 passwords you have that you use all over the place, which means you end up reusing the same password, which means you're going to end up in this top 1,000 list. So passwords have to die. They're not going to work for us. But there's lots of other ways you can authenticate. So we're part of the FIDO Alliance. Um, we've, with Samsung, we've got the fingerprint reader that allows you to, to, uh, to authenticate and make a payment with your fingerprint. There's lots of other ways to do that. But actually, talking of the biology side of worlds, there's some really cool things happening. So has anyone seen the Nimni band? It's a really interesting band. This actually measures your heart rate, and you wear it on your wrist. And interestingly enough, your heart rate, your heartbeat, is actually very unique to you. So you can use a heartbeat to measure um, who someone is. And people say, well, what happens if I go running or I'll do this? It's actually the, the pattern that matters, not the speed. So you can still be breathing really, really fast, and you can use someone's heartbeat to authenticate themselves. So you could use a heart to authenticate. Um, everyone knows what this is. This actually is a machine. I have one of these at home that measures your brain waves. So actually, you can measure someone's brain waves to authenticate them as well. So that sounds weird, but actually, a, a large courier company in Japan is actually building these into their vans. And the drivers need to wear this in order to start the van, so security vans. Because you can steal someone's finger if you want to do a fingerprint, but you can't steal someone's brain. Um, so actually, they're using these to start the van. And um, it can be, appear a bit sinister, because not only is these good enough to identify someone, but actually, uh, some researchers have used one of these and ask someone a few questions, and actually using the brainwaves worked out what their password is. So you can use them both ways, but actually I think using brainwaves is going to become a much more common way to identify someone. So not only do you need to identify someone, you need to broadcast that identity. 
So everyone here has seen Minority Report, um, a film with Tom Cruise. There's one stage where he walks through a store, and as he walks through the store, all the posters around him activate, say, welcome back, welcome back, with his name that he's trying to pretend he's not. Actually, this is happening already, because we have these things called beacons. And the beacons are out there, and the beacons are available, and PayPal, of course, has a beacon. But with a beacon, you can actually identify someone as they walk into the store. So basically, your identity and your authentication can be broadcasted as you come into somewhere. And this is the next generation of shopping. This is how shopping is going. Because what happens here is, what is the worst thing about shopping? Any guesses? I guarantee it's pain. Paying is the worst bit of shopping. No one enjoys paying for stuff. And the stupidest thing about it is they make you queue up to pay. That's silly. So let's get rid of that. Let's actually get you, as you walk into the shore, to be automatically identified and using something like the PayPal beacon here. When you want to pay, you say, I'm good, I'm leaving, you walk out. And that's actually happening today. That's already happening with beacons. So the next splice, I would say, is your body will authenticate your identity and will be broadcasted for the purposes of commerce and efficiency. So we'll start using your body to identify yourself. How many senses do you think we have? So I, uh, we're supposed to have five senses. And if you read the definition, any of the f facilities are sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch by which humans and animals perceive stimuli originating from outside or inside the body. So what's this then? What are wearables? Do we not have more than five senses now? Now, you might say, OK, well, these things all use the five senses. So you know, your Google Glass or your wristband, you're using your eyes to touch your sound. This is changing, because now we have the world of embeddables coming. And embeddables are a little sinister, but interesting. So we've already got the Google contact lens. So I don't know if people have seen that. Google have made a contact lens, which is not as sinister as it sounds. It actually measures the blood sugar level in your eyes, if you're diabetic, to work out when you need to take your insulin. Um, but actually, a, another a group of people have taken that uh, technology where they're able to stimulate your optic nerves in people who are blind and use remote sensors to give that person sight. So they're able to see without eyes. And they're able to connect technology into optic nerves and allow you to see. So I would argue that's a different sense, because it's not technically sight. It's actually coming from somewhere else. This as well, so not this exactly. So this is one I read the other day. Magnets, small magnets inside your ears, actually inside connecting up to your optical nerves. Again, currently being used for deaf people, but they've actually broadcasted music. I love this idea. This means people can lis listen to Justin Bieber without me ever having to hear his horrible voice ever again. <laughs> but basically, again, this is a new sense, a new sense being built into your head, magnets inside your head where you can broadcast things directly into your body. Smart tattoos. Has anyone seen these? They're very interesting. So tattoos that are actually built into you but are able to make senses, detect things. They've already done smart tattoos with light. They've d um, done these to detect a variety of different things, basically antennas. Um, but smart tattoos are getting more and more common. So you actually end a world where you could have your tech tattooed onto your body. This is the scary one. Motorola. This is an actual one. Motorola have developed a smart pill, <laughs> um, a, something you ingest, <laughs> put inside your body. It actually just uses RFID at the moment, which isn't that sinister. Well, depending on who's using it. But yeah, they could, the world of nanotech is very, very close, and we're already getting there. But the ability to actually ingest something that runs through your bloodstream, and it's getting small enough. RFID could be in your blood. So I'd say splice three. You will, and you probably already have more than five senses. Um, and I think that's getting very, very interesting. Data. We all have a lot of data. We're all generating a lot of data. Data storage is not infinite. So we need a more efficient way to store all of that data. So every time you're doing something, that data is being generated. Now, if you look at where biology can help us here, people will recognize this. This is DNA. Now, DNA is really, really interesting because you can encode to DNA. It replicates itself. It does a variety of different things. But it actually is a very efficient way to store stuff. And you may have seen it space age, but actually there's a group in the UK who've managed to use DNA to encode data. And what they've done is taken Martin Luther King's speech and encoded it onto DNA, had that DNA self-replicate, and then reproduced the speech on a different strand of DNA. So you're able to use DNA to store data. And what's really interesting is you could take the world's entirety of data, which is approximately three zettabytes of data, encode it on DNA, and put it in the back of one truck. 
So it's extremely efficient. Now think back up. DNA backs itself up. That's what RNA does. It replicates DNA. So this is automatically, automatically self-backing up data. I think that's really interesting. And you think, well, what's going to happen then? Well, firstly, mutations will happen because DNA does that. That could be really interesting. One of our data self-mutates and it evolves itself. But of course, you couldn't use your DNA because your DNA is kind of important. You might want to live and have children and things. But you could actually use DNA as a mechanism to store stuff. So I think DNA itself could be one of the ways we're storing stuff. It's, you, know, you just need to feed it. You need to provide it oxygen and all that kind of stuff for it to survive. And you know, we don't need electricity then for all of this storage, all of these data centers. Splice 4, DNA will be used to store data. And natural mutations will create interesting things. This speech can be a bit sinister for some people. But I'm this biologist, so I just get excited by the technology. So this is something called optogenetics. So optogenetics is a new science where they've actually taken um, DNA from organisms that react to light, so usually algae, but actually some animals react to light, fused it in with neurons, and they're then able to use light to turn neurons on and off. So they can basically, using light, trigger certain parts of brains. They've only done this on mice so far. They're able to basically trigger a, mice, a mouse into a certain behavior using light and these neurons in your brain. So there's the possibility to control how your brain um, interacts with certain things. So switch off things like pain, perhaps, or switch off other things. So that's from an outside. But this is my favorite philosopher. So this is a quote from my favorite philosopher. Has this happened to any of you? The older I get, the more stuff I forget. Now, I have a history of Alzheimer's disease in my family. And I think it, it, it's kind of disturbing to see your loved one forgetting things about what they've got around you. And I've always thought, wouldn't it be nice if all that useless stuff I don't really access very much, I could outsource it? Wouldn't it be nice if some of those memories that I don't really need that seem to take, you know, the film, my favorite films or just things I saw randomly, I could store them somewhere else and actually keep the important stuff in my head? I think. The idea of putting your memory in the cloud is actually an interesting one. And wouldn't it be interesting if we can then take things that are not that important to us, but actually archive them and store them? And if it's something like Alzheimer's, you would then be able to take that archive and recreate it by using something like optogenetics on the neurons in the brain to recreate those memories or put them out there. I think that's very, very interesting. So cloud stored memory. Now, these are all different areas where it goes so many places that biology and technology is combining. I would argue we're already at the first stage of being cyborgs. I think we're nearly there. We are walking around. Now, my mobile phone knows more about my partner than I do. So it, I, it knows when her birthday is. I always forget her birthday. Um, it knows all kinds of stuff about what's happening around me. And that cell phone fused with my biology or any other technology fused with my biology will actually make me a cyborg. So there's an important message here. It's very, very important. As man evolves and we get there, we have responsibility. So I'd finish this speech by, bit, by saying, basically, be a good cyborg, don't be a bad cyborg. Thank you. <laughs>